Hey guys, for more like this, don't forget to hit the subscribe, the like and the notification bell. Hi everybody, we have a special guest today, Peter Kraut. I pronounced that properly. He's the author of the book I'm reading right now, The Great Silver Bowl, guys, and it's fresh off the press. I'm a, I'm a slow reader, but I'm already, it's an easy read, uh, Peter. I'm at a hundred, page 190 out of uh, three or 400 pages, and I just turned a few pages, and it's a big picture charts that I was happy to see that you talk about also the Dow to silver ratio and all that, but uh, just introduce yourself, please. Um, you'll do a probably a better job than I just did. <laughs> well, thanks, thanks, uh, Patrick. Um, so yes, I, uh, I uh, recently published this book, The Great Silver Bowl, um, all about, I guess, really the, the entire, the way I view it, at least the whole opportunity in silver and how that's building up and why it's important people to need to know about it, understand it and how they can take advantage of it. Uh, and I also write a newsletter called Silver Stock Investor. And um, I started that in January of last year. So it's been up uh, and running for almost two years now. And the book was published um, early part of this year, uh, it was May. And um, so uh, actually a, an old colleague of mine uh, last year, uh, when I was into the, the newsletter, only for about a couple of months suggested writing the book. And I remember thinking, oh, geez, do I really want to get into this? <laughs> and, uh, and then I thought, well, you know what? I've done lots of research in, in the topic. I've done lots of writing. I had a good starting point, so a lot of material to, to at least get me started. And then I also thought, uh, I'd actually been wanting to do it for a while. And then I, you know, this is, think back, this is March of 2021. Uh, we were very much in the depths of uh, the COVID pandemic. And I thought to myself, why let a pandemic go to waste? I mean, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> I'm not doing anything. There's no, almost no social time. You know, it's the dead middle of the winter. And so I said, all right, let me, let me get this started. And, uh, and I, and I just, you know, started the, the outline uh, came to me very quickly and uh, moved things around a little bit and then sort of started to plug in the parts and obviously did the research for the things I didn't have, which was, you know, maybe three quarters of it, the things I didn't have, you know, some, some research or data on. And it went from there. So uh, I actually said nothing to anyone for about six months and then um, started to mention it to colleagues and so on. And uh, things really, really sort of fell into place. And uh, so it took nine, 10 months to write, took a couple of months to do some editing and some polishing and, and to finally get it out there. So it's it's available now on Amazon and in paperback and in Kindle. And uh, I'm really happy. The reaction has been fantastic. It's been most of the time since it was launched in May, it's been in the top 10 in its category. Wow. Uh, in, both in Canada and in the US. So I'm really happy with uh, the response. So Peter, just um, perhaps you could explain um, why silver? What's what's your background? Why, out of all of the things you could have chosen, why silver? <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I like things that are uh, that are cheap <laughs> and, uh, and have a really, really good um, outlook. Uh, I mean, those are the two best ways I can summarize silver, especially right now. It remains very cheap. And it has a tremendous uh, upside, uh, cheap in on so many metrics, uh, and one of the perhaps least known and, and least uh, understood is if you just compare it to so many other metals, base metals, platinum group metals, precious metals, um, silver is the only one of all of these metals that is still below its 1980 high. Everything else has surpassed its 1980 high. In many cases, we're talking about hundreds of percent higher already. Silver is still less than half of that uh, of that peak. So just on that basis, it's it's got a lot of catching up to do. And if you look at all of these ratios, which you guys I know are, are uh, comfortable with and familiar with, um, silver has a tremendous upside. And you know, uh, it's, it really is unique uh, when you look at all assets, not just metals, but it's very unique because it's the only metal and, and in many ways, the only asset that is both, uh, has multiple industrial applications and is money. It's been considered money for four or 5,000 years. And it was in our money up until about uh, 50 years ago. Um, and um, as uh, you and I, Patrick, were chatting just before we started, um, 
silver is is the word for money in something like 14 countries. So yeah. people have a, a very, very long history with silver and are very, uh, or have been very, very familiar with it. Yeah, definitely. It, it's good because uh, you're, um, you were, I was always wondering whenever somebody has a big project, like let's say writing a book, you wanted it to succeed because you didn't tell anybody. So, sometimes often I remember if I have a big idea and I'm not 100% convinced I want to do it, I tell everybody right away because you know people are going to say, ah, it's not going to work, Patrick. But you really, you you went ninja for six months. And then after that, when you really, the, when you knew there was no turning back, that you were really going to deliver the, the book there, then you started uh, telling people, man. Exactly. That's, I mean, that's super, I think, yeah. <laughs> I think part of it was, you know, maybe a little lack of, uh, you know, full confidence that I was going to make it to the finish line. There was some of that. And then I guess when, I, you know, at that point, it would have been probably about three quarters written. And that's when I said, okay, I'm, I'm close enough now. And uh, I, I am going to make sure that I finish this thing. And it, and it was great. And, uh, you know, I don't need to go into the details. But when I did that, it actually opened a bunch of doors. Um, you know, the feedback I got was, oh, well, so-and-so, you know, can probably help with this. So-and-so can help with that. And I mean, it was a godsend because really uh, things fell into place. And I mean, I could have, you know, managed and I would have finished it on my own uh, without, you know, the support of a few people. Um, but it would have probably taken me another year to do all of that on my own. And uh it's, there's no question it would have not been um, as good of a final result because the input that I got really actually did a lot. In, in turn, when I look at the feedback that I'm getting, uh, a lot of it uh, certainly is is strong, without a doubt, because of some of the, the the suggestions and the help that I got to to get the whole thing finished. Yeah, well, the timing, I think, as a chart trader, sometimes for us, it's the price that drives all the stories, but the timing of the book couldn't be better because now instead of publishing that book at the end of a 10 year bull run, like let's say 2011 or 1980, where everybody's trying to publish books about, oh, silver is going to a million. You're publishing the book when it's hard because everybody's bashing silver. I know like so people, ah, oh, Patrick Silver sucks and all that, but this is probably actually the best time for people to to, to start uh, getting acquainted with silver because of the price action, like we, we've covered like the gold, um, to SPX ratio or the Dow to silver ratio, all that. Technically, they hadn't broken out yet, but they're very close. So um, it's interesting. I'll tell, I'll tell you one that has broken out that we, <laughs> this is probably going to annoy some people, but the um, the silver to uh, Bitcoin ratio or the Bitcoin to silver <laughs> ratio has uh, broken in favor of silver very decisively. Yeah. So I'll put, I'll put out a couple of tweets the last couple of days that's probably um, getting under the skin of some of the. Uh, the, the, the crypto stackers, but um, I mean, there's no denying the fact that uh, silver has made a, a, what looks to be at this stage anyway, something of a really important breakout versus uh, versus Bitcoin. It's, uh, you know, it's hard to almost believe looking at the chart what it might imply for both silver and, and cryptocurrencies. But, mm -hmm. you know, those lines in the sand are, are very clearly there in the technical charts. And as Patrick just said, you know, putting your, your book out at this particular point in time, could be uh, very sort of prophetic, really. And you look back on it in maybe five, ten years time and uh, just just realize what perfect timing it was. I agree. In fact, one of the charts and I know you guys are, are big on charts, so I thought I'm going to uh, refresh this and and, uh, and look at it. And I do follow it regularly, but it's the SIL. So the SIL ETF yeah. to the SPX. Yeah. yeah. And uh, with today's action. Yeah. That is it, it twice in the last month or so bumped up against the 200 day moving average. Today, it's actually above it. Yeah. And so uh, and has been climbing since the start of September. So yeah. this is very bullish. Silver is uh, silver stocks are clearly starting to outperform broader stocks. And, you know, um, you asked about the book and why I wrote it. If you look at I'm sure you guys follow this stuff, too, but if you look at the um, the data on the 60-40, uh, you know, classic 60-40 portfolio, 60 bonds, 40 stocks, sorry, 60 stocks, 40 bonds. Um, we've had the worst year in almost a century. Um, and I was looking at um, looking at a 100-year a, a chart of those drawdowns in the 60-40 in the portfolio just yesterday. 
And something that struck me is it's funny sometimes, you know, and you guys, again, would probably know this better than anyone, but sometimes you kind of just sit back and look at a chart and, you know, you're, you're looking at something specific, but other times you're not looking for something specific, but something jumps out at you. And so what jumped out at me was this chart was the, the yearly, uh, you know, uh, moves up or drawdowns in that portfolio and going back over a century. So what jumped out at me was that if you look at the, um, the uh, 30s, some of the 40s, and then you look at the 70s, in both of those periods, the drawdowns were not every year, but they were in multiple years. They came in clusters. And so that's what struck me was that when, when these drawdowns start in that portfolio mix, you, they tend to come in clusters. So that's scary. And it should be scary for investors who, who believe too much perhaps in that uh, you know that that mix for a portfolio if they think that's true diversification because if we've had the worst year it's very likely a telling sign for for what's to come in the next over the next few years it may not be true next year in fact the drawdown was so big this year I'm not sure we're going to see I think we'll actually see positive returns in that in that portfolio next year but for the over the next several years, I think we're going to see multiple years of drawdowns. So that's that's something that I think is worth looking yeah. at, considering. Well, the stage is set. The way I see it is, even if look in the seventies, okay, in the two thousands, silver and gold did well. Also, when U.S. equities recovered in a bear market rally. So once, let's say, uh, gold breaks, uh, SPX breaks down versus inflation or versus gold. When there were bear market rallies for SPX, silver and gold did very well and they outperformed. So what I'm looking at is when the U.S. equities rally, so let's say those portfolios of 60, 40 portfolios going up, that's fine. But I want to see gold and silver outperform. So I want to see them outperform like that. In the 2000s, that's pretty much how it behaved. But I noticed in the 70s that there were periods where gold and silver they went up with U.S. equities when U.S. equities bear market rallied and they outperformed them. But there was periods also where U.S. equities completely tanked and they did not drag gold and silver down and gold and silver went up. So, look, yeah, those are scenarios that we're, we're looking at. But it's look when you look at these long, long term cycles, it's, it's just uh, we have to awaken folks to the, they get out. They got to get out of their daily daily charts, right? And a book like that, what I like is you have evidence from a whole spectrum, you know, yeah, you have the fundamentals, yeah, you have the history, you have charts. It's like you really went through everything you could grab on to get evidence for or against, and you compiled everything together and you tried to explain it so so folks could understand. And um, yeah, that's evidence gathering, right? Kevin, it's like, it's the scientific approach. You want to bring it's, as much information <clears throat> as possible. Yeah, that kind, of, that kind of evidence is is crucial. And you have to look at every angle. You look at all of the ratios. You look at the capital flows. I'm just interested, Peter, you know, how you kind of see the silver um, price appreciation um, being a reflection of uh, industrial demand versus um the sort of appeal as if you like a poor man's gold. I mean, when we get a, when we get a precious metals bull run um, and gold begins to rise at some stage during that bull run, then silver gets attention. And because it's not as expensive for people to take a position in um, that surge in demand, I, you know, it, it certainly appears that silver has a very spiky nature to it. So that, you know, for example, in the 1980s, it spiked to $50, the Hunt brothers cornered the market and all that kind of stuff. And there's a huge spike up. And, you know, even in more recent history, silver has this kind of spiky, reactive nature. Um, just curious to know how, how you sort of see that playing out and whether you see what's to come as being a, a future price spike, effectively, that might take silver into triple digits, or uh, whether you see silver as a result of, you know, one of those factors that I mentioned, you know, sort of achieving a higher plateau in, in price terms. Yeah, so I, um, you know, I, I, I've often said that I, I see silver again. It's you know it's about fifty percent of its of its use is industrial, and I'm going to argue most of the rest, most of the other fifty percent, is some sort of investment slash monetary um, you know applications. Mm. Uh, and so because because you include things like um, silverware and jewelry, and 
for the most part, people buy those things because of its value and tend to keep it because um, it, they consider it valuable. And so it can always be resold and you recoup a, a good portion of the value, even if it's silverware or, uh, or jewelry. So half of it's industrial, half of it's investment. So uh, the way I see it is that because in the industrial side is so important and I believe is dramatically gaining importance. I don't see most of the industrial uh, necessarily backing off in any meaningful way for the for, for several years into the future. I'm going to say even decades. I think that the industrial side, the industrial demand will help provide a rising floor under the silver price. And then it's going to be the investment demand that will be the wild card will, that will drive those spikes that we're going to see over time. And they will be many. They will be um, they will be uh, isolated in some ways, but I do think that they're also going to contribute to what you were saying, Kevin, and that you're going to see spikes. Some will see considerable drawdowns after the spikes. Some, I think, we're going to see plateaus afterwards. We're not going to see the price back off dramatically. Uh, probably back off somewhat, but then start to continue to move sideways. Here's a great example. Um, just, you know, uh, a month or so ago for a, a, a presentation I had to do, I looked at, you know, people have been down on silver for the last year or so, at least. Um, and I said to myself, okay, well, what's realistic? Let's, let's look at a little bit longer term, let's say the last six years or so. So I said, let's look at the three years prior to 2020. Uh, and then uh, the three years more or less since. And so the three years prior, silver averaged about $16. The three years since, silver has averaged about $23. So uh, yes, in the last year, it has been weak and sentiment's been bad, but people need to back up a little bit and look at the bigger picture. And on that basis, which is a fair amount of time, the last six years, silver is up about 40% where, you know, in the last three years over where it was in the prior three years. So that's, you know, that's quite the, a decent performance. Um, and so if anybody was patient following this market, decided, you know, uh, uh, you know, willing to do a little bit of homework and say, okay, what looks underpriced, what's undervalued, Silver absolutely answered that, uh, you know, that that request. And um, I've been asked multiple times, what kind of what kind of low do you think, uh, you know, silver uh, could 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 sell off to? Where would you be a buyer? Um, and I've said, you know, 17, 18 dollars. I, I was asked this back in uh, in June and um, I had looked at that prior and the all in sustaining cost for for silver is around. 17, 18, now it's closer to $19 with some of the inflation being baked in. But I said 18. And so we've seen it test that level multiple times. It went a little bit below it in the last few months, but it's that's been the meaningful bottom ever since. And now we're at uh, 22 and a half today. So this is a great day <laughs> actually for us to be to be talking about silver. Silver's had quite the run in the last few months um, and there's plenty of momentum. I've been saying, before today, you can go back and look at interviews. I said, you know, I think that this move we've seen over the last few months reflects silver and gold starting to price in. The markets look at six to nine months ahead. And I do think that you know, we got confirmation from Powell yesterday when he spoke to the Brookings Institution, yesterday being Wednesday, uh, November 30th, um, that when the market, uh, becomes convinced that at the, the Fed will at least pause, then, you know, let's say within the next sort of six to nine months, then that's when we're going to see these these metals start to, to, to take off again. And I think that's what we're seeing play out right now. Yeah, well, it's good the way you did it there when um, with silver, I just talked with Kevin, like there's spikes, but the moving average of silver, a long term moving average, let's say seven year or eight year moving average has always been going up inversely to the destruction of your purchasing power, just like gold. So with if people are lucky or they know classical chart trading, they're able to buy silver when they know it's historically below the mean, starting to outperform mm -hmm. and not buy when your grandma tells you to buy it because it's 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 tripled already. It's at a spike. You know, that's not. It's almost a disservice. Yes, silver is good, but you don't want people buying at a parabolic melt-up 
top, right? You want them buying when it starts turning up. But the moving average for silver, you're right, it's been increasing. It used to be 25 cents, it used to be $4, $8, and now the moving average, I don't know where it is, like you said, $18, $20, depending which one you're looking at. But it's been gradually going up. And um, so, yeah, it's important to look look more at the moving average for silver and see where the price is in relation to that. I mean, so, so and another, another interesting point is also, of course, you know, talk about the pivot, uh, as people sort of keep referring to, you know, when, you know, the day comes that the Fed decide to reverse their uh, their rate rises and start bringing some some rate cuts and whenever that might be in the future. But uh, people very often talk about that that as being something that's going to sort of spell the end of the um, equities bear market. And um, <laughs> you only need to spend five minutes actually looking at the chart uh, and pulling up the SPX and pulling up the Fed funds rate chart. And you very quickly realise that on almost every occasion when the Fed does pivot and the SPX is um, below its three year moving average, it uh, it just sells off even further. So, so, you know, kind of waiting for this pivot as though it's going to sort of suddenly send uh, the SPX and general equities uh, back to the moon again. That's not really the scenario that, that that we're seeing. I mean, it's far more likely that when that day comes, the market sells off and precious metals continue in their bull market. And this is all part of um, this overall sort of shifting of the tides, changing of the seasons, movement of capital flows that, that takes place during these business and econ economic cycles. And you know, it's interesting talking about what you were saying a moment ago about where silver going to bottom, seventeen, eighteen dollars. You know, it's it's always very, very hard, even as a chart trader, to spot where that bottom is going to be because there's no kind of evidence uh, when the price hits its low point. You're still you're kind of guessing, you're guesstimating, you're kind of trying to figure out where the low might be. And it's not until price actually turns round and starts to cross a few key points like key moving averages or a breakout line that's where you then have the scientific evidence that the tide has in fact turned so as an investor you know trying to catch that falling knife trying to guess that bottom whether, whether it's going to be 17 or 18 is in a way it's kind of academic you know you can you can start to perhaps scale in slowly you know if you're a long-term investor at those sort of levels because you feel there's there's a lot of value there or you can obviously wait till there's that little bit of evidence, the chart technical evidence, and get in pretty early on in the bull run. You know, even if you were to buy at 22, 23, $25, in the grand scheme of things, at that point where it's breaking out at 25, $28, and there's a very clear breakout, that would still be very early in terms of the move that is, is likely to come after that. And you get a doubling or a tripling or a quadrupling of, of silver over the next few years. So, you know, so it's always a payoff, I think, between the weight of evidence and actually trying to get in at the very, very bottom, which I think is, you know, if you're trying to just pick the bottom the whole time and, and catch that falling knife, it's 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 a very risky game. It's a, it's a risky, risky game to play. I, um, I agree, Kevin. I mean, and I yeah. do talk about that in the book, you know, in terms of, I, I, you know, I'm the first one to admit that mm. silver is one of the most volatile assets. And imagine looking at junior silver explorers if you think silver is volatile. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, there's hardly, other than maybe, you know, options or something, there's hardly <laughs> anything more volatile. And, uh, but, you know, people, so two things about that. One is people, I, I feel honestly, should not let that scare them away because there are ways that you can manage that. Um, and the, um, the uh, the other thing is that you know you can you can do things like you can as you said you can layer into a, a position it doesn't have to be an all or nothing it can also be that if you feel that uh, you know you've you've gotten some great gains on on a position or or whatever it might be you can also layer out <laughs> you don't have yeah. it doesn't have to ever be an all or nothing kind of thing and even within silver equities there are all kinds of ranges of risk you have etfs you have physical silver these are some of the sort of uh, lower risk uh, ways to to have uh, exposure and then you have everything in between you have royalty companies large producers you know mid tiers uh, developers and then you have junior explorers and that brings you across the, the risk spectrum and so you know diversification within a number of names within each of those uh, weighting your portfolio so that you're not too heavy in the sort of higher risk, uh, you know, part of the spectrum there. Again, there's all kinds of ways. I think the bigger risk is not having any exposure to it. I think that's the bigger risk. And, um, you know, I've mentioned this mul multiple times, but uh, something called recency bias, I think, is 
investor's biggest enemy, a guy, you know, Ray Dalio, that many of your viewers probably are familiar with, um, has said, and, and I completely agree, that, you know, the, the future is unlikely to look much like the recent past. So if you're basing all of your decisions on how things have behaved in the last, I don't know, five years, 10 years, uh, you could be in for some big shocks. You know, I've and, and I think the hard part right now, and it's kind of becoming clearer, but I've been saying, you know, since last fall, at least, it's one of these things that, you know, it's because you spend so much time looking at these things and studying them that over a little bit like what I was saying earlier, when I looked at the chart of the drawdowns in the 60-40 portfolio, then you, something jumps out at you, which was that these drawdowns come in clusters. So it, when I looked back at, let's say, uh, the, the late 70s, early 80s, what happened in gold and silver and what happened in stocks and bonds. So, uh, and then what happened in the late 2000s? You had the reverse happen, right? In other words, stocks, uh, you know, started to, to, to uh, reach the end of a, of a long-term bull market and precious metals began a bull market. But if you look at, let's say, the year and a half or so, on either side, I mean, the bottom is clear in hindsight. So, okay, well, at least we can do the research knowing because we, you know, enough time has gone by, we can see that bottom. So you look at the bottom or the peak in hindsight and you say, okay, what happened on either side of that bottom or that peak? Let's say about a year and a half on either side. So that three year period, I call a messy transition period, right? And so you get a lot of volatility. If I can't remember the numbers exactly, but if you look around 1980, 1981, again, when silver and gold peaked uh, and interest rates peaked, naturally bottom, uh, uh, bonds bottomed. But so, so if you were to get into bonds, again, with hindsight, looking at that peak uh, in interest rates and the bottom in bonds, you were to pick the, the bottom in bonds, go, wow, this is tremendous, you know, and I think within, it would have been, if my memory serves me right, within about maybe six to nine or 12 months, uh, you had a tremendous run up in bonds because interest rates came down and your, your bonds became more valuable. But then over the next six months, you had a huge drawdown because there was a correction again, uh, you know, a pullback. It was 40% this drawdown <laughs> in, in like 30 year bonds. It was, you know, it was scary, but, um, and again, you look over a, a little bit longer period of time. Again, with hindsight, that bottom in bonds was clear. But to go from the bottom to watching the, the, uh, the bull market play out was accompanied with plenty of volatility. And yet, um, it, 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 over time, it proved to, to be the actual bottom. And so same thing with precious metals. And I think that, you know, uh, you know, if you look at actual charts and actual prices, gold and silver pretty much bottomed around, uh, you know, late 2015 or so. And in the last, I'm going to say few, you know, maybe year to two years, I completely believe bonds and stocks have peaked. And so uh, I also believe that we've reached a, sort of a, a midterm bottom in the precious metals. And we're in one of these messy transition periods. And I think that the action of the last few days and week, maybe months even, are starting to provide some clarity in terms of direction. In fact, uh, you know, for for uh, for the precious metals. So, so, so this. I was just going to say this. This might be a, a question that you'd, you'd prefer not to answer. But I mean, if we think back to 2003 to 2011, silver moved from what was it five dollars to fifty dollars. It went up ten times. Gold, interestingly, did very nearly the same thing. It went from 250 to, uh, to roughly $2,000. So that went up about nine times as well, nearly 10 times. And that actually was pretty good um, comparing to some of the uh, to some of the um, uh, the miners as well. It's surprising, you know, yeah. gold and silver going up 10 times. There are plenty of miners that, you know, sort of only matched or perhaps didn't even quite match those sort of gains. So, you know, that the metal itself is can be a very good place to to invest. But anyway, back to my question. <laughs> I'm going off on a tangent, uh, which I often tend to do. But uh, the question was going to be, do you have in mind a sort of rough uh, nominal price for silver and a rough kind of timeline? Do you have a sort of a, a sort of range of figures in your mind? I mean, I know I do, but, you know, I, 
I just wondered if um, if you if you have a sort of rough rough targets. So so yes, I do, and it's funny because it's yeah. only at, over. I'm going to say probably a few years of research and running these these uh, these ratios and charts and and looking at history and you know we're, there are so many things really only that we have to, to base ourselves on uh, and the most uh, the best analog is the 1970s of course for us because it was a multi-year uh, bull run for uh, the precious metals and um, so so actually in the book I use. Uh, I use several of those of those charts with the ratios. The ratios to me tend to be the best sort of uh, uh, give you the best handle on where things could go. Um, so uh, one of them is the gold silver ratio. Another is uh, we talked about the the Dow uh, to silver ratio, and what I like a lot is the uh, the housing price uh, average housing prices to silver ratio. So that amongst others, when I look at all of these. And I didn't know this in advance. And so when I took those numbers from the past and how silver reacted and how much it went up from, let's say, you know, sort of uh, bottom to ultimate peak, and I applied those same ratios going forward uh, using, I guess, silver, uh, silver's bottom in uh, 2000 and 2001 or so, around $4. I actually ended up with, uh, it surprised me too, but <laughs> an ultimate peak in the silver price of about $300. Mm -hmm. And, and it, you know, I thought, okay, this is crazy. It's outlandish. And then in the last maybe year or so, I'm starting to see forecasts for even higher than that. You know, I've seen $500. I've seen $800 recently. And um, the 500 is actually someone who was a... Um, or still is actually, uh, but but pre previously was uh, manager of a commodities fund that was one of the largest commodities funds in the world, uh, and saying ultimately we could see five hundred dollars silver. Um, and but in any case, how I got to the three hundred was I apply these ratios. I use the ratios from the past where they bottomed, meaning silver was at its peak versus the other asset, and so on the. Um, on the uh, gold silver ratio, if you use 15 as a bottom, and I have been saying since over a decade that I think gold will ultimately peak at 9,000, uh, sorry, at 5,000. And now I'm thinking it's probably gonna be closer to 10,000. And in the book, I give, uh, I give uh, detailed accounts from very well-known, very respected analysts mm -hmm. that actually have this 10,000 target, um, that if you use that, uh, ratio bottom of 15 mm -hmm. uh, from 1980 that um, with $5,000 gold and 15 you're at $333 silver. Yeah so, that, I mean it's, it's interesting to hear those numbers because that ties in quite closely with my own research which I mean I, I have to say that these numbers for people listening you know they, they sound crazy but just bear in mind that these sort of ratios that we're talking about what it what it does it is it tells you what is reasonable it doesn't tell you what is definitely going to happen it's not 100% guaranteed but it it gives you a framework it gives you an idea of what's reasonable and what's not reasonable and you know as a bit of a sort of a scientist geek mathematician meteorologist you know all that kind of stuff rolled into one I, I love you know I love looking I love looking at these numbers I lo love looking at the charts and I love to know what's reasonable it gives you a range of possible future outcomes a bit like producing a weather forecast you get a range of outcomes and they tend to cluster around the most likely outcome um, and for me, when I when I looked at gold, it came out in the ten to twelve thousand dollar range. Um, and for silver, um, it very often comes out when you run various models and various scenarios somewhere in that three hundred dollar range. It's it's very easy to get well above one hundred uh, and two hundred, and there seems to be a sort of a, a cluster of targets somewhere around that three hundred range. And then you've got the lower probability numbers above that. So I see a a sort of a, a, a very reasonable chance of you know getting into let's say 200 to a little bit over 300 dollars so yeah i mean that that makes perfect sense to me i don't know if patrick's got any thoughts on that well that leads me maybe to uh, two tough questions and uh, you could skip them if you want <laughs> peter but for, for that the 300 fine but do you have a, a time a time uh, eight years before we peak five twenty that's the first you know, part. Then, I'll, then I'll, I'll shoot you the hard question. Of course, of course the other thing as well, which we, well, I didn't mention there, is inflation, of course, because inflation is ongoing underneath all of this. So, 
you know, you can only need to look at the 1970s to see how ref inflation ran away from us. And we had, you know, a, a decade of um, uh, of high inflation. So that kind of, you know, you have to set your your nominal value against inflation as well. So it's more a question of how much silver is outpacing inflation. Um, but anyway, yes, get back to Patrick's sure, question. No, but that's a, that's that's a great point. I mean, yeah. if I look at the 70s and to be fair, I think that the runs actually started before 1970. So let's say, you know, a few years before. So roughly, say, 13 to 15 years was the 70s uh, market, uh, um, bull market. I think, and, and I've looked at, you know, what kinds of, what average commodities bull markets tend to run. And that ranges 15 to 25 years. I think that we are in an historically long and, and massive bull market for commodities, which actually started probably around 2000, 2001. Um, same for the precious metals started around that time. And so I'm going to say 25 to, to 30 years is probably what uh, the current market is going to last. So if you look at 2000, 2030, uh, 20, you know, let's say 2026 to 2020 to 2030 <laughs> is the range, I feel, where you've, we'll, ju you've just pinpointed the, uh, the major cycle. Uh, top for gold ahead of the next uh, major cycle low in 2032 so gold has a seven seven to eight and a half year repeating cycle so uh, so yeah that would that would be coming in around about uh, 2032 I think. so that's so. interesting that's interesting here Kevin because I don't follow those cycles the way you do and yeah. I you know obviously I do it from my perspective and it's interesting to hear that uh, that they that they match yeah. or at least closely very, so, very closely. Uh, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the sort of major cycle low would probably come in in the early 2030s, 2032, 2033, that kind of area. So peaking a few years before that would make perfect sense. Right. So the hard question. Uh, Patrick. Yeah, I, well, <laughs> what what piece of evidence would that would uh, make you re seriously reconsider your thesis that would happen? Something happens like sometimes we always say, ah, oh, they, they, they can't do that. But what would happen? And you would say, OK, maybe maybe I got this wrong a little bit there. Let me I have to readapt my thesis. Do you ever think about that contrarian uh, devil's advocate uh, argument? Sure. I mean, and I think as a responsible investor and analyst, you have to. You really do have to. You have to always look at the, the opposing argument. Um, I, I don't think you're doing anybody, especially yourself, a, a favor if, if you're not doing that. So do you mean on a more sort of, uh, I guess, planning or macro side, or do you mean yeah. on a supply well, demand side? I, no, I'll, I'll give you my example that always comes to mind. I always say, Kevin, gold, if let's say there's debt destruction and the purchasing power of the US dollar actually goes up, let's say they decide to be responsible. Well, of course, gold, gold value is going to go down because the US dollar strength, let's say it's going up. So the price of what I thought, instead of gold going to 5,000, well, it could stay the same or go down to 800. If they destroy all the debt, there's less slosh of money. So for me, sometimes, but everybody says, Patrick, they have to print, they have to print, the whole system's gonna implode. Well, I'm just wondering, what if they let it implode? And of course, gold value is gonna go down. So for me, that's always in my back mind. Let's say they do let it, like in the Great Depression, they, they, it's like there was total deflation. So I'm wondering if you have that argument, did you ever think about that one or do you have Absolutely. other that that's that's for me that's the ultimate uh, argument because this is what this is that's what the uh that's what uh, you know of course silver is slightly different again because of the industrial applications so that for me is interesting on the silver side because it's always got it's got yeah. this continuous and growing you know um uh, field of of uses and applications. So, but if you look strictly at sort of the investment monetary side, I completely agree. That is that is the conclusion that I have as well. That you know it's based on this growth, um, ongoing, and in and dramatic growth in debt. And and in the book, you know, I, I talk about that uh, you know over and over and over. And so um, that would only be, uh, I guess, um, we would only reach that point. With some kind of of a of a uh, of a reset of a reset somehow in currency and so on, and uh, um, I I think that central planners will will fight tooth and nail, and and that will absolutely be a last resort, uh, and it and it, <laughs> it might be imposed on them. <laughs> I don't even want to go into details, you know, in terms of how, but. Um, 
they may have no choice at some point. You know, that kind of scenario I could see playing out. And if if you have such a, uh, a dramatic uh, kind of event, then you're going to want something tangible that has proven itself for millennia more than ever <laughs> and more than anything. And so, um, yeah, you, you, you know, it, it, after that kind of event, yes, things would, things would, would uh, you know, if you get this reset and, and or you get the, the destruction and the debt, then you're taking away the, uh, the arguments for precious metals because they are, uh, they are hedges against inflation and in, uh, chaos and debt. So if you take that away, of course, then you're taking away, again, uh, the motivation and, and the, uh, the arguments to hold them. But um, so much needs to happen before getting there that uh, it, 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 you absolutely want exposure to it. But, but I agree with you. Yes, for sure. You have to consider that possibility. Uh, um, it's becoming, I hate to say it, but perhaps less remote. Uh, but, you know, as Doug Casey likes to say, because something is inevitable, it doesn't make it imminent. And so, you know, we probably, the three of us would probably agree, we thought a lot of these things would play out much earlier than they've played out. Uh, but um, we, I, I remain convinced of the path forward. And so that, that hasn't changed my mind. And, but I continue to examine both sides all the time on an ongoing basis. You, I think, again, you have to do that. Okay, so never, never ceases to amaze me just how far the can can be, uh, can be kicked. Exactly. <laughs> you know, the financial <laughs> crisis, the dot-com bubble, all these things, you know, everyone's throwing their arms up saying, this is it, you know, with big reset, financial, you know, it's the end of the world and all the rest of it. And uh, the can gets kicked, the debt increases and uh, somehow or other the party carries on. But um, yeah, you, you're right. These, these, I think experience does teach you, patience teaches you that these things play out over longer time scales. It doesn't mean that the uh, the end goal is any different. It just right. uh, is quite a winding path to get there. Exactly. Um, Patrick, you mentioned uh, early on about the timing of the book and, you know, uh, I, you know, being being the one who, you know, launched it and, and all of that, you know, thought to myself, well, you know, obviously I, you have to kind of pick a date and you go with it and, and things will be what they are. And I felt initially like, uh, you know, S Silver's kind of uh, weak right now. This was uh, May of uh, 2022. And I thought, mm, well, let's just see what happens, right? The response has been great, so I can't complain. But something that stuck struck me was um, I, I handed a copy to a, a young guy, I'm going to say around 25 or so, uh, who actually helped with with some of the uh, some of the artwork and so on. And uh, he said when I when I brought him the physical copy for him to look at, so he could you know see what his work turns out to to look like. He said, "You know, your timing's really good." And I I was a bit taken aback, and because I you know I didn't quite feel that same way. And I said, "Well, what do you mean?" And he said, "Well, you know, people are starting to look for alternatives." And this was this was May of this year, so you had a clear uh, beginning of a downturn in both stocks and in bonds. And I remember thinking um, around April, May, June, that people who had 60, 40 portfolios, and especially the bond portion, were opening their, their investment statements and looking at them and thinking, well, hang on a second. I've, you know, my advisor told me, own bonds, they're safe. They can never go down. Well, guess what? If you own a bond fund and central banks are hiking aggressively, more aggressively than they have in decades, bonds are going to take a hit and they did so those portfolios that they thought were diversified and balanced and all these things um didn't look so great within a matter of a few months at, at the start of the year and for the most part the rest of the year it's continued to get worse so um he was right <laughs> he was right he said people are starting to look for alternatives yes and uh and he said you know this is the kind of thing that people are, are going to be open to so I'm and, and people looking for those alternatives is exactly what shows in the ratio charts and the capital flows. And there, you know, once you've pulled up those graphs and those charts in front, you can in front of you, you can see them literally taking place in front of your eyes. Those um, indices and stock markets that are heavily weighted towards tech 
and don't have much in the way of energy or commodities in them uh, are going to suffer. And that's why, of course, the Nasdaq has been uh, falling like a rock and other stock indices around the world have been somewhat more resilient, in fact, because they have better allocations of, for example, oil companies and um, shipping companies and, you know, goodness knows what, those, those sort of uh, sectors that are um, actually doing quite well at the moment and they do help to diversify um, some some indices. Yeah, it's the best time, Peter. Seriously, it's it's the we're not telling people to buy like us as technical traders. We we're going for the, but see, it's not when we have laser eyes. That guys, the the laser eye stuff. I, it's, it's like the biggest telltale sign you're close to some type of top. It's like we have nothing of this. We people throw rocks on us when when we talk about silver and gold. <laughs> they throw rocks. I, look, you get rocks, my, Patrick. I get my, my, tomatoes. My <laughs> in laws, they uh, they're they're going to retire now, and the the market's turning down, and they're trying to convince themselves that it's going to turn back up, and there's no worries. And Jesus, it's like it hurts my heart because I can't. I'm not a financial planner, so everybody has got to do what they have to do. Exactly. But from the big picture charts, the way I see things going is inflation, destruction of purchasing power is the recipe. That's what's happening. Right. And it's going to be mon monumental, the breakdown and in, in, in destruction of purchasing power. I have a chart. I don't want to I have a chart. The destruction of purchasing power now, the rate of change is accelerating to levels last seen in the 1970s. It's like wow. it's that steep, the destruction of purchasing power. It's a time bomb. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's like uh, you need stuff that's real, guys. You drop on your foot. It's real. So even if the purchasing power goes up or down, that thing that's real, it stays real. It's worth whatever it's worth. You know, if your fiat's worth less, then that thing's going to cost more. If your fiat's worth more, that thing's going to cost less. But you need stuff that's real right now. You cannot do price to earnings ratios, uh, forward looking uh, 30 years to break even the company. That stuff makes no sense to me now. Sorry for, for the emotional thing, but it's happening, guys, in front of us. Peter's book shows it. There's a whole bunch of evidence in there. Our charts show it. There's a whole bunch of evidence. And the fact that we're not popular, we're not on CNBC, should should tell everybody, ding, 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 ding. You know, don't listen to the guy who made $10,000, uh, 10,000 uh, percent profits. That run's done, guys. It's done. The guy who buy Bitcoin at $1 and sold at 65 that move is cooked. It's done. You have to look at the next asset that's going to do ten bagger. You know, exactly, exactly. I mean, one of the one of the charts I was looking at yesterday was inflation. I think I have one in the book, but there's a there's a another one that has uh, the, it's inflation in the seventies. Another chart has the, the same chart has overlaid on that is unemployment, and so I'm saying this as maybe a little bit of a warning, you know, to anybody who's who's watching because. Um, in the 70s, the inflation came in three waves. So you, you kind of, I guess, uh, late 60s, early 70s, and then mid 70s, and then finally at the end of the 70s. But later on top of that was the unemployment rate. And the unemployment rate, actually, as inflation tends, because we have these waves, as inflation peaked in a, in a wave, unemployment tended to bottom slightly before. So I'm saying this because if, uh, people are, you know, arguably, I think right now we could be, we could have seen, might have just seen a bit of a peak in, in inflation. And part of the reason is if you look at things like the base effect. So you're, we're always looking 12 months back. We say, okay, what's the inflation rate today? We always look at over the last 12 months. Well, it's been really high. Last, you know, 12 months ago, it really started to climb. And so if it's easier for the, the monthly rate now going back each time over 12 months to look over, let's say, you know, last November or last October. And for us to see a peak now, and have the base effect say, well, it's it's slightly down from 12 months ago, or it's flat from 12 months ago. People will start to get the feeling that, oh, this is you know this is done now. I don't need to worry anymore. Inflation's behind us. Central banks waved their wand and they fixed everything, and you know everybody's happy. Um, but again, if you look at that chart of the 70s, that is not what happened. What happened was the inflation peaked, unemployment bottomed, bottomed. So as the inflation rate started to come off, unemployment started to go up <laughs> because the, the lag effect, which the Fed itself talks about, was that inflation, 
this, this climbing inflation for, let's say, a year or a few years started to affect companies that had a higher cost of business, started to affect, affect housing, which we've started to see as well. You know, uh, things uh, uh, slow down tremendously. So the, the lag effect is that housing slows down, the employment related to housing slows down because of higher rates, of course, mortgages, et cetera, um, and higher interest rates affect companies, especially tech, that tends to you know, rely a lot on borrowed funds. Cost of business is higher when interest rates are higher. So we've heard about this. You know, they've, a lot of them, Twitter, uh, Meta, all these companies are laying people off. Well, the employment rate is going to very likely start to tick up now that the inflation could uh, likely, I think, has temporarily peaked. But, but again, don't be uh, misled. If we have a repeat, and I think we will, of the 70s, the inflation will start to peel back, will we'll come back off, you'll eventually reach a trough. So let's say we peaked at, I don't know, 8 or 9%, and I'm just guessing here, let's say, you know, inflation, because the Fed's been aggressive, ends up sort of peeling back and coming back down to and troughing around maybe somewhere around five or six percent, which would be ideal for the Fed because if that's where they end up peaking their rate hikes, then you have this sort of meeting of the two and everybody will say, okay, great, we're in this new sort of neutral zone now, nobody needs to worry. But that's not where it ended. You had a new wave of inflation start again after the first one. And each time you had a new wave in the 70s, the inflation actually went higher than it did in the previous cycle. So, um, you know, viewers should not be surprised if we saw sort of eight, nine percent in this uh, cycle of, of inflation that we're going to see maybe 10 right. to 12 in the next. Well, uh, and, and I think I think the Fed obviously realize that as well. And, the, and their language is starting to communicate that they're starting to say, well, you know, we're not going to pivot anytime soon. And as long as inflation is a problem, we're going to we're going to keep with the with the rate rises. And I think as the market begins to figure this out and begins to realize the similarities between now and the 1970s. And to be honest, the feedback that starts to take place because, you know, you cast your mind back a year or two years, the talk was about transitory transitory inflation well you know i said at the time and i think you know a lot of analysts said at the time transitory my my ass kind of thing you know <laughs> pardon, pardon <laughs> the language but you know that these now that it clearly isn't transitory and we've had inflated level higher levels of inflation for a long period of time certainly over here in europe you know you just look at the ppi charts i mean i've been i've been showing that ppi chart for germany for for a best part of a, a year, maybe two years now, and it is way off the. I mean, it's past the 1970s. It's past the peak of yep. um, World War Two. You know that the terrible um, high PPI levels that were just post World War Two. Um, I mean, we're off. We're off off the chart there. Yes, admittedly, it's pulling back just a little bit at the moment. But the problem is, it's been elevated at these levels for so long now that these high producer prices have had to be passed on to consumer prices, and that has. Uh, found its way into uh, inflation. Of course, inflation is high. So, you know, you're right. I think, you know, this, this, and I'm, I'm not um, an economist by, by qualification at all, but, you know, clearly feedback mechanisms that begin to kick in when inflation is, when it's not just a spike, when it's not just transitory, there's stuff that happens under the, under the hood, under the bonnet that starts to make this more of an ingrained problem you get this wage price spiral for example which we're getting here in the uk now all the unions are out on strike because right. inflation is 10 percent and they're being offered pay rises of three percent so everybody goes on strike the services break down and then all of this starts to feed back into the problems prices go up and suddenly things get out of hand and that's what's happening here in europe at the moment so you know sitting there in the united states canada you know don't don't sit there thinking that you're going to be immune from this. There's a whole load of inflationary pressures being passed on from China as well. They're exporting their inflation. So, you know, we really are entering, and I agree with you, Peter, you know, we're entering a period here of extended high inflationary uh, times. And I do expect, like you, for this to, to sort of come in waves as well. So it's Sorry. interesting to hear you say that. Yeah, uh, it's going to take time to, to all that stuff. It's like your Newtonian physics. It's like they pushed it, they pushed it, and the reactions, the lags, and then it's like they 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 overcorrected. Exactly. It, it's it's your waves that you explain. It's gonna take some crazy excess in one direction. I mean, look, until people say death of U.S. equities, like 
the, right. then there's no top in precious metals right. at all. Exactly. At all. So Definitely. we're good, guys. It's just it's it's this the these waves like they come in threes, uh, ripple si- si- sine waves that get just amplitude until they they then they they, they start to unwind. We're just starting. This is the first wave, the, the first, and that thing's going to reverberate in more craziness. It's going to be insane what, what's around the corner. Like, I don't know. People think I, I'm happy about this. I'm not happy, but I'm prepared, so I'm able to talk about it. But people, you can't do the ostrich, guys. You cannot right. do the, that. That's what your book's bringing out, our charts. it's People cannot do the ostrich anymore and just following that, that guy at the bank who says, See, that guy does not know the word sell, the guy at the bank. He does not know. He's a financial advisor for real. He's he's certified. I'm not. And he, they don't know how to say, uh, guys, well, maybe you should be holding more commodities. Maybe you should be more cash. They don't know that word. And everything invested 100% of the time. It's it's total nonsense. I'm not a financial that's a, that's advisor, a very, guys. It's a, very, it's a very good point, Pat, actually. I don't want people watching this to go away with the impression that we're all excited about all this, all these terrible no. things happening because it's not about that. It's about right. awareness and it's about you as a... Uh, an investor or a trader, you know, whatever finances you have and you want to save. It's about not seeing those destroyed by, you know, by the craziness that's going on in the economy. You don't you don't want to see a 10 percent loss of your savings every year just because of inflation. You want to at least see your your net asset value, you know, maintain its value and preferably to increase in its value. So it's, it's you know, it's not it's not about, you know, wanting any of this stuff to happen. It's about the realism to just accept and and understand yeah. that this is the situation that we're in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, for me at least, that's one of the reasons that I that I wrote the book because uh, I'm passionate about it. I believe it. Uh, I've done the research and I feel that I understand it and I uh, I, I I can see the arguments for uh, and a lot and strong arguments for exposure to to this whole sector. And, um, you know, uh, what I wanted to do was make it an easy way, an easy read and easy for people to get an overview of what was going on, you know, what the history is, what the current setup is, uh, what the outlook is and, and how to how to act on it and to take advantage. And again, you know, um, I have a couple of examples in there. People shouldn't feel like they need to take what I call outsized risk you can have fantastic exposure with fantastic upside in the space in the silver space with some of the lowest risk companies i'll give one example um i don't remember if it's it's exactly right but uh, wheaton precious metals is truly the only uh royalty streaming company in the silver space and um it has about 44 or so ex- percent exposure to silver which is pretty good. Uh, it's about as close as you're going to, it's the highest you're going to get uh, in the royalty streaming space with exposure to silver. Well, in the 2000s, that stock did, if my memory serves me right, did about 17 times return um, in the space of like three years. So <laughs> I think it was 2008 to 2011 in that time frame. And this is a multi-billion dollar company. So um you know, you again, you don't have to take the biggest risk to have tremendous potential upside in in the solar space. It's it's not it's not uh, required. And good, good. on, I was going to say on that note, that's probably uh, I, I know we've been chatting away for about an hour now, so <laughs> <laughs> we could probably chat for another hour or so. Okay. But uh, Kevin. Yeah. Peter asked me, uh, like, I saw 30 minutes, but I warned Peter, I said, we have a, I have a tendency. I'm looking at the time we're... here, thinking that 30 minutes quickly doubled. <laughs> uh, well, we're, we're in th- like, uh, this is valuable content. I hope, hopefully people watch this from, from A to Z, you know, doing their jogging, whatever, because. You want to hold that uh, book up again, Pat, just to remind people of the title. Yeah. We'll put the links um, in the, um, in the description so people could, uh, could order, order it and the great, links the great all your stuff. Ball. The great silver ball. Yeah, it's an easy read, guys. I'm a slow reader, and I'm uh, more than halfway through, though. So uh, it's in big font, big enough for me. So, do have, uh, um, Peter, do you have any? Uh, so- are you on social media? Do you want to tell people where they can find you? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So I'm on uh, both Twitter and LinkedIn, and so uh, you could find me uh, Peter underscore Kraut on Twitter. LinkedIn is Peter Kraut. You'll find me there as well. So and and otherwise, you can follow pretty closely what I'm doing. Uh, pretty much all of the time at silverstockinvestor.com, which is, uh, you know, a kind of a um, 
consolidation of a lot of that and uh, the, the newsletter that I write as well. Well, I know both Good. myself and Patrick are very, very grateful that you've spared the time today to to talk to us and uh, share your thoughts on on precious metals and especially silver. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for uh, for, for, your, for all of your thoughts and for all of your, your input. It's very, very, very valuable. I know our, our listeners and our watchers are, are really going to appreciate this. Uh, it's yes. been been my pleasure and uh, I'd be more than happy to do this uh, at some time again in, in the future. Yes, definitely. For sure. Good stuff. That's the day. All right. <laughs> Bye, Peter. Thanks, guys. Cheers, Peter. Thanks so much. Cheers. Bye-bye for now.